Welcome to Belmont Journal. I'm your host, Maribel Carvajal de Salazar. Today we're here with one of the three candidates that are looking for the select board seat. Welcome, Jeff Lubian. Great, thanks. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Jeff, can you tell our viewers about you and your family? Sure. Uh, I'm a father of a daughter at Belmont High School. Uh, I live uh, in town with my wife, and uh, we've been uh, in the you know, on Unity Ave, uh, Precinct 7, and we when we first moved here, we had a black lab who was the uh, dog of the neighborhood, and then now we have a two-and-a-half yellow lab who is named Oakley, who uh, is cute, but he's an escape artist, so he's a little different than our previous dog. But uh, we live here. We love the town. Um, we're also in our neighborhood known as the Christmas and Halloween house, and what that is is we do big productions at Halloween and Christmas. Halloween, especially Halloween night, we have strobe lights, smoke machines, uh, dry ice, and scary ghouls and goblins everywhere, and the kids just love it. And uh, at Christmas time, we channel our inner Clark Gris Griswold, where we um, have tons of Christmas lights on Belmont Lights Best Customer in December and January. And if we don't have it set up in time, the, the kids in the neighborhood let us know. So it's become quite a tradition. And then we're also uh, the neighborhood uh, entertainment house. We uh, help organize a annual block party. And we also have a big summer barbecue where we actually have a full garage band that's in a garage that plays and we invite all the neighbors. So it's, uh, it's a great area and we enjoy living there and my family and I really, really enjoy it. Jeff, what brought you to Belmont and how long have you been living here? So we've been here for 17 years. Uh, my wife and I were renting in Newton. Uh, we enjoyed living there, but it just didn't have a good sense of community. There was a lot of renters, and we uh, just went to work and came home. And we started looking for a place. We actually wound up here in Belmont we, because of its proximity to Boston, its small town charm, and good schools for our eventual future children. And we actually bought a two-family with a friend of ours, a best man at, my, at our wedding. And since then, he's moved on. So now we own both units, and we have some wonderful tenants. And it's uh, it, it's been a great experience, and that's one of the main reasons we moved, and we've enjoyed it uh, since we've been here, and becoming more and more involved with the community uh, for the last decade or so. Uh, Jeff, what do you do for work? I'm an economist by training. Uh, right out of uh, undergrad, at, I went to University of New Hampshire and studied studied economics. Uh, right out of school, I joined a, a consulting firm, economic consulting firm in Lexington called DRI. This is actually a, a lot of Bel Belmontonians that have uh, our alum of, of DRI that I've met over the years. Uh, then I went to graduate school, continued pursuing economics, uh, received my master's in economics. And after that, I've been doing consulting for businesses and governments, and then started to focus in the marketing analytics and attribution area. And since then, I've uh, worked at Bose Corporation for a number of years and now I'm currently at iRobot and as my family can say I'm very much into consumer electronics so it's sort of my passion and I've uh, focused in that that area. How have you served Belmont these years? So I've been serving for about 10 years. Uh, it started during the last override uh, and select board race so it was about 2014-15 and I really started to realize just how important local government is in your daily life. You know, we like to think the national does have its impact, but really the day-to-day -day of how your town is run has a big impact. So I became interested, ran for town meeting for Precinct 7, and then wanted to do more and learn more because I found it interesting. And I signed up for, asked to be uh, appointed to the OPEB working group. And what that was is the other post-employee employee, employee benefits group uh, working group, and that was to really understand what the liability is for our retirees' uh, health insurance. So similar to the pension, where we have uh, to pay out pensions, we also are re uh, required to provide retirees, both on the municipal town side and the school side, with health benefits. And we really wanted to understand what that liability was and what's the impact to the town. And I was fortunately uh, fortunate enough to be put on a committee with some seasoned pe uh, vets that worked on committees for a long time in Belmont, Mike Widmer, Ralph Jones, Liz Allison, and Chris Doyle. So I really learned a lot in that committee. From there, I decided uh, learning more, heard about the Warren Committee, the Town Finance Committee, and thought that would be a great opportunity to volunteer and learn more, but also to have more influence for earlier on in the process, the budgeting and finance process. So I was appointed to that in 2016 
where I still currently serve, and I've been the chair of that of the Warren Committee for the last three years. Some other things I've worked on uh, as chair, I was a representative of the Warren Committee to the uh, Superintendent Screening Committee last year. Uh, I worked with some local residents and our ch and select board uh, member Roy Ep Ep Epstein, on um, as well as Dante Mazzioli, Ian Childress, and Klaus Becker on coming up with a leaf, uh, leaf blower bylaw, which was a challenge because there's a lot of different competing interests and different opinions about leaf blowers and when should we switch to gas versus electric, and we came up with a good compromise. It was a really good experience. And then I've also um, been working at the polls for a number of years now, about four years plus. During COVID, uh, Ellen Cushman had a hard time finding volunteers because obviously a lot of people didn't want, want to be in public, and I said, sure, I'll do it. And then for the last four years, I've been clerk for Precinct 1, and it's been a great experience uh, seeing how elections are really run behind the scenes and uh, seeing the whole package and understanding how things work. So I've uh, you know done a lot, and I still think there's a lot more I can do. Yeah. What did you decide to, why did you decide to run for a select board seat? Yeah, I really... I decided to really leverage everything I've learned. I'm also very concerned about where the town is. But during the course of doing all this work, not only getting a baseline of, of how a municipal works, all the different intricacies, I built some strong relationships with department heads, with different committees. And I think we're at a crucial point in Belmont where we're going to have to make some really tough decisions. Obviously, the override is going to be one of them. But that's one of many that we're going to have to make in the next few years. And so I, I really think my hands-on experience, the relationships I have built will allow me to leverage that to really continue, I think, some of the good work that has started, but that needs to continue. And I think I can add a lot to that as, select, as a member of the select board and look forward to the opportunity. What experience do you have that will make a good fit for the role as a select board? Sure. I, I think some of the best experience I can draw on is being chair of the Warrant Committee. Um, there's 15 other members, uh, all appointed, some appointed by the town moderator, uh, uh, the chair of the select board, chair of the school committee. And over the last few years, it, you learn a lot about how to run a meeting, run an organization, be productive, allow people the opportunity to speak, uh, be heard listen to different points of view from experts, town people in town, and really learn that you have to work collaboratively and come up a lot of times with compromises because there's not one solution all the time that, that everyone can agree to. It's a lot of complex issues. And I think that experience of managing that, especially of the last year, year and a half with the challenges we've had with the financially, the um, having to work with other committees and and hear different opinions and, and, and bring us together. I think I've been able to take my knowledge and now those relationships and that skill set that I've also developed in my career and be ready for what is an executive position in, in the town. And that's really being able to facilitate conversation, listen to the experts, digest data and insights that are brought to you, and come up with the best decision possible and, and, and let people feel part of it because they should be, but also even if it's at the end it's not exactly what they hoped, they understand how we got there, and I think that makes a big difference, and those are the skills I've learned and continue to learn and would like to uh, bring to the select board. If elected, you're going to have a three-year term. What will be your priorities? So three, yes. Um, first and foremost would be uh, the financial crisis we're in. Um, I. The override is a big ask, it's a big step, and um, I'm not diminishing that at all, but I think that's one of many steps we still need. This override will help us, but it does not solve our financial problems. More analysis, more fiscal discipline, and commitment from all the committees and all the folks in town are needed to, to put Belmont in a much better financial position. Um, so financial stability and sustainability, I think, is key in the short term and in the long term. And dovetailing in with that is also how do we generate a town that can drive more commercial business, be more business friendly, more zoning friendly. So that combined with the finance really points to long term planning. We haven't had a lot of long term planning in Belmont for a while now. I know that over the years there's been some, but it seems like we just go from year to year 
getting everything done, and then we just worry about the next year and the next crisis. And if we have a long-term plan and commitment to stick to those plans, I think we'll put ourselves in a much better position uh, for the future. And then the third is really to use all of those levers to provide, still continue to provide high quality education as the demands and needs of education change over the years, which we've seen since the pandemic, but also to allow people to stay here, whether that's through zoning and allowing people to downsize into more affordable uh, options um, or ways of tax relief for seniors so we can truly keep the character of the town but manage it for the future. And that's, those are the three main priorities I'd focus with a lot, of, a lot underneath that. Jeff, where do you stand on the override question, which will be on the town election ballot? Sure. Uh, I'm for the override. Um, we are in a fiscal shortfall, a deficit, a deficit that we've been, been able to manage over the last few years with exorbitant uses of one-time funds. Uh, people have heard it as free cash, undesignated fund balance. It's sources of revenue that only we only get one time. And some of that has been through, a lot of it's been through the government programs such as ARPA and CARES Act. Some of it was from government services and schools being shut down during COVID. And so we've leveraged a lot of those one-time funds to plug this gap. Well, unfortunately, those funds are going away. And we don't have those for this next coming year. We have some to help offset the override, but we don't have enough just to keep the lights on, keep the same number of employees uh, that we currently have. And that gap is about $7.4 million that we've estimated at the Warren Committee. So we need just 7.4 to for a minimum to keep things uh, going. Now, the override number that the select board has determined is 8.4. And what they've layered on is some investments that I think are wise. One is sidewalks. We all know the sidewalks in Belmont. Unfortunately, they're only getting worse, especially with tree roots and, and just, you know, life, life expectancy of sidewalks. And there's been a lot of unfortunate accidents that just seem to keep increasing with especially seniors tripping. Uh, my wife had an experience where she tripped one time and broke her ankle a few years ago. And again, it's, it's something that needs to be addressed. So adding more money to that, it's still going to take time to fix all the sidewalks, but it's at least a, in the right direction and adding significant capabilities, doubling the size of the sidewalk budget. So another aspect of investment that with the $8.4 million override is the uh, investment in the schools. It's in updating curriculum that's out of date. It's an early intervention. And it's also looking to bring out of district special education in district, which is great for the kids. They don't spend an hour plus on the bus to, an, to a remote location. Um, they're able to do extracurricular and after school sports and be with their, with their, stu with their friends. And then in, long, in the long run, it's, it's more affordable for the schools to bring these uh, capabilities in-house because out of district is so expensive. And we might be able to even offer services to other towns to, for their children to come here. And we were able to do this now mostly because we've been able to increase the capacity of our classrooms. For a number of years, we weren't able to, and so this allows us to do it. And I think these are prudent measures that will set us up for success in the future. And I appreciate it. It's a, it's a, it's a big ask, and a lot of people are struggling with this. I, I've, you know, a couple of years ago, had an increase in my mortgage payment because of the increase in taxes of 500 a month. That, that's a number, and I felt it, and we had to make some decisions. I drive a 24-year-old car, so it's, uh, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't pass me by that this is a big ask for a lot of people, and it is a, and it is a challenging decision for them. Where do you stand on the assessor question, which will be on the town election ballot? Should the members be elected or appointed? So I voted into, as a town meeting member. I did vote for uh, appointed or hired. Um, it was a recommendation of the Collins Center, which uh, gave a lot of good recommendations, and also a recommendation from the state about 10 years or so earlier. Uh, we did this with the treasurer. It did not affect the ability of, of the treasurer. It actually has improved efficiencies. They've reduced headcount, and they've modernized in some areas. It's not to take away from the previous treasurer. I think Floyd did a fantastic job for the town. but. We were lucky to find him, and there's no guarantees we can find uh, another treasurer 
like Floyd, who could, who could run. So I think appointed, as many towns are doing now, is the right thing. And, and this spills over, I think, to the assessors. I think the current assessors are great. They're some of the best in the state. And I hope they would stay on and ask to be appointed. But in the future, there's no guarantee that we're going to have that expertise here. And this allows us to appoint, hopefully, people within town uh, who have this expertise. But then if it isn't the case, we can then go elsewhere and look for the best candidates possible. And that, I think, allows us to continue to shore up and build a financial, cohesive financial unit that the Collins Center recommended all the way from the town finance director to the treasurer to the accountant to the board of assessors. How do you think Belmont can reduce its spending to prevent need to future overrides? So that, that's a tricky question. It's a difficult question. If we had the answer for it and it was easy, I think we would have, we've, we would have implemented it. And we have implemented a lot of recommendations from the first financial task force, uh, some recommendations from the second financial task force, recommendations from the Collins Center. We started to implement recommendations from the Structural Change Impact Group. I mean, one of them uh, that I helped bring up and, they, and the, the committee worked on it and it, uh, implemented it through the town finance director was just improving our software capabilities for financial planning and management. We were using Excel and to manage unwieldy Excel sheets uh, can be dangerous you know, and just take a lot of time. And now we have a cohesive financial tool that the Warrant Committee's report is now gonna leverage to have standard tables and charts. It frees up our time, it frees up the uh, town administrator staff time. I'd like to see us actually try to leverage that in the schools. I think they're, they're looking to do that, but it's, uh, you know, there's upfront investment in terms of manpower, mostly to do that, but I think that's a good example. Um, I also think allowing our town administrators, department heads, and school administrators uh, the leeway and the and to be innovative. They, they do this daily, they're the experts. Where can they find efficiencies? I know on the town side, there's significant restructuring with the Office of Development and Planning. Uh, it used to be community development that is looking to leverage um, less resources, but do more, you know, uh, smarter, uh, better, uh, faster. Uh, Dr. Geyser has just taken over as superintendent. That's a monumental task to take over, let alone being an override year. Let's allow her and her staff the opportunity to evaluate the schools and where, where efficiencies or that can be gained, but then reinvested in the schools so that they are able to do more with less increases in budgets from year to year. I think those are the areas we're going to have to go to. And then I think also it's just not an expense side. It's a revenue side. Where can we maximize more revenues? Where can we bring in more businesses? Shift that burden a little bit from 95, 5, 95% property tax to 5% commercial to, you know, a 90-10. It's going to take time and effort, but through initiatives that I think we all need to get behind to be able to, to meet these needs and the challenge that Prop 2.5 uh, puts on towns in order to raise the revenues needed to, uh, to meet escalating costs of running uh, the, the town. Jeff, how will you reach out to the neighbors and not yet engage in town affairs to foster more diversity, inclusivity, and participation? Sure. Yes, yeah, one thing I've come to realize uh, running for select board is that a lot of people are not, uh, f f a lot of people are not uh, understanding or not I I are informed of what's going on in their town government. And the first few years I was here, it was the case. You're just busy with life. You're working, you're you, you're doing stuff around the home, you're raising your family, there's just not a bandwidth to do it. So I think getting the word out more, I think we've done more with forums and posting, I think is key. I think more communication, leveraging social, leveraging video. I think the superintendent just put out a, a video that was very helpful. People can watch it quickly and quickly digest the information. Um, I think that's important. I think the select board being more accessible you know, our, our time is, is precious, but we should also be there to hear from folks and allow for people to bring their, their thoughts to the select board and give comments at meetings. Uh, and, and in terms of diversity, I know we had the, the diversity uh, analysis and we have a committee. 
I've heard from the committee and I think they are some committee members and they want to be able now to enact more of that both on the town side and I know the schools do. So let's support that and let's try to get more people involved. I'm, I've been encouraged uh, since the pandemic, there's a hundred new town meeting members and a lot of them come from much more diverse backgrounds than and ages than we've seen in, in the past. I mean, we even have a, a, uh, a young young person, you know, relatively right out of uh, high school, running for a, for a townwide townwide position. I mean, so I think things are in, in motion. We could, uh, there's always more we can do, and I would definitely promote doing more of. Our town contends with various long-standing needs amid limited resources. How do you propose maximizing our funds to address critical areas such as infrastructure maintenance, technology? wastewater management? Sure. Um, some of those I've touched on already, so I'll just quickly highlight them. I think, first of all, foremost, an override is needed, again, uh, uh, at a minimum, to be able to maintain the current level of services the town has come to uh, expect and enjoy. Um, I think leveraging more revenue sources through significant zoning changes, the MBT, uh, MBTA communities um, work that the town is doing. Um, I think is great and we that will help with some of our housing challenges some of our uh, commercial challenges with some potential mixed use solutions but I also think we need to think about how do we how do we become more business friendly especially to first and all foremost the businesses are already here um, Belmont Center is struggling 20% vacancy I've met with the business association um, how can we get more foot traffic there how can we work how can the select board work with the landlords to try to mitigate some rent increases or creative solutions to businesses that are struggling right now because of the foot traffic in this post-COVID world. And I think we need to do more there by providing incentives whether and events and work creatively with those businesses to bring back people to Belmont Center. But then also, how do we increase our, our office spaces, our commercial bases that draw will bring in funds that are much needed? Uh, that's a longer-term play, but I think it's definitely something you have to start to get there. And we've started that already with some of the work that was done at last town meeting on the restaurant side, making it easier for restaurants to establish themselves by right, cleaning up red tape, time to open business. I've heard that's a real struggle. Um, but there's other things that we need to do. And I think all, a lot of this all points to uh, what they call is a master plan, that it's a long-term plan for Belmont that looks at numerous factors. A lot of towns have it. A lot of towns that struggle with the challenges that Bel Belmont's been struggling with do not have it. So I think we need to uh, look to and establish that. I've already mentioned about empowering our employees and our leaders in town to think of new creative ways and give them the leeway and, and the support to implement those, but, and especially if they don't pay off in the short term. It takes you know a little bit of time. And then... Ultimately, I think we just need to realize that we do have to work on expense growth. The expense growth has been a challenge. Um, Double-digit growth and high single-digit growth in some of our key line items is just not sustainable. And so we need to, as we've been saying in the Warren Committee and, and other committees, is how do we bend the curve? And part of that, I think, along with the override, is let's create, and I've been spearheading this, working with other committees, the school committee, the select board, the capital budget, we all need to work together to come up with an agreement, a town agreement where we're gonna manage our finances much better, bring down expenses, look for new revenue sources, and, and frame that out for the public to see that we, we're, we're serious about this and these are the policies and guidelines and direction we wanna set this town in so that we don't necessarily never say never on an override. I think that's very difficult in the environment we're in but uh, not to have an override that is so large that people are just um, find it daunting of how they're going to afford the, such a large override. Jeff, your first year will involve collaborating closely with Roy Aston and Elizabeth Dion. How do you envision working with them? Sure. Um, first off, I think there's the one thing I, I, I've liked about the select board and I've seen, I've seen it over the years is there's been a good sense of collaboration and, and uh, respect and understanding, not only for each other and each other's opinions, but also for those of the town. It can get um, town members and other committees. It can become challenging at times, you know, especially when you're faced in tough situations. 
And so leveraging, again, my experience on the Warren Committee in particular as chair, bringing that sense of openness, even keeled, balance approach, listening to all, all factors, and having good conversations and collaborating, but then understanding in the end we have to compromise and come to the be best decision possible. You know, I'm my own person. I have my own ideas and my own opinions, and I'm not going to, you know, and at times I probably won't agree with uh, my colleagues on the select board. I know there was some disagreement over the assessors, but in the end, as we've done on the Warren Committee, we shake hands and we know what we're doing is best for the town, and we move forward to the next, the next issue at hand. What do you think are the most pressing problems the select board is currently facing, and how will you contribute to make them better? Uh, first and foremost is the, is the, is the uh, financial deficit, and twofold. If the override passes, and I've mentioned this already, it's the first step. It's a huge step. I appreciate that, and it's needed. But we need to implement a lot of the things I've mentioned, a community agreement, financial stability, long-term planning, to minimize any future overrides and to be able to get us on a course where we don't have to always manage one year to the next with a crisis, what I call triage budgeting, instead of long-term budgeting and planning that allows us to have confidence and stability for our residents and them estimating their tax responsibilities each year, our infrastructure, and our businesses to know that we have a stable, balanced government going forward. Um, on the other side, if an override does not pass, it's going to be um, very daunting, and that's where I think you want experience with budgeting and especially experiencing working with other committees and other, other individuals in, in a collaborative way because tough decisions are going to have to be made. If the override doesn't pass, we're probably looking at budget cuts of about 10% over the next two years. And the split of that is going to be close to 70-30, 70% schools, 30% town. And there's these higher level numbers, but they're still going to have a significant impact in the, uh, the way this town is governed and the, what the services are that this town is, is offering and could have a long-term adverse impact. And we need to minimize those impacts, but also keep an eye to being fiscally responsible and and setting us up for success with potential solutions in the near term and in the long term. Thank you, Jeff, for coming, and it was great to get to know you more. Yep, thank you. If you can please tell the viewers, why should they vote for you on April 2nd? Uh, I, I'm asking for your vote on April 2nd because I, I'm the only one running that has long-term experience working on different committees in different situations in the town and the finances and the town government. I'm also the, uh, have a master's in economics that gives me a good foundation for this, this type of work. I've built the relationships and also the skill sets to manage at the executive level what this position is. And I think this sets me apart from the other candidates and uh, I ask for your vote on April 2nd. Thank you, Jeff. Good luck with the campaign. Thank you. Belmont votes April 2nd. That was it for today. I'm your host, Maribel Carvajal de Salazar. See you next time.